Welcome. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for our monthly webinar series and our session on Certification 101. You can become a certified environmental educator. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Katie Naven and I'm the director of the Colorado Alliance for Environmental Education. I love talking about certification and certification was actually the very first committee that I joined when I came to see it when I got involved with CAE before I ever worked here. So I have been involved in the development of the program. I have submitted a portfolio and participated in the program and now manage the program. So hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions that you have today. If you are new to CAEE, we are a professional association for anybody and everybody who is advancing environmental education. Our members, uh, we have 850 across the state and they're teaching about every topic when you think about the environment and reaching folks from birth to seniors. So doing a ton of great work. As an organization, we hope to foster collaboration between all the folks doing great work, mobilize support and drive excellence by providing professional development like we're doing here today. We've got a few great things coming up that we wanted to let you know about in our monthly webinar series and uh, some workshops that you might be interested in joining as well. Um, our next webinar is gonna be on February 25th. It is about teaching environmental issues and phenomena with the living atlas of the world. So diving into a little bit about how you can use GIS in environmental education. We're super excited to have Joseph Kursky presenting that uh, towards the end of February. We also have a workshop coming up, all virtual, uh, but it'll be over two sessions and we'll meet to discuss Colorado's new academic standards. The science standards are going into effect this fall and it's a great time to start thinking about your programs and uh, how you might want to adapt them and align them to the new standards if you haven't done that already. Also just wanna remind everybody that every month we have two different calls. Uh, for folks to just jump on and talk about whatever needs you're having. Uh, 2020 was a weird year. 2021 is going to be a, a weird year as well. And there's still some uncertainty about what we'll be able to do. And uh, this is an opportunity to jump on and talk about uh, how might you be responding? What's been really successful? What challenges are you facing? Uh, we offer one call on the first Wednesday of the month, which is all about adapting programs and, and a programmatic focus. And then on the last Wednesday of the month, we generally talk about uh, e-management. How are you fundraising? How are you uh, handling HR? What issues are coming up that we can help sustain our organizations? Most of you are probably Zoom experts by now, but just in case, uh, please type any questions into the chat. Kat will be manning that and looking out for any questions that pop up. Uh, feel free to mute yourself or unmute yourself if you'd like to share something with a group or ask a question, uh, but please keep muted while you're not talking. And then uh, feel free to turn your video on or off and we totally understand that we, Wherever we are, there's lots of things going on that you might need to take care of. So do whatever you need to do um, while we're on the call today. I do wanna take just a moment and do a brief land acknowledgement before we get started. Uh, this is one way that we can really support equity by beginning our time together with an acknowledging our history and colonization and oppression and that our organizations have had a role in that. We acknowledge that these systems of oppression are still in play and that historical events as well as current events cause impact and trauma. It's important to remember that wherever we are is the traditional home of native peoples, many of whom were forcibly removed from their lands so that we could be here today. For me in Denver, we are in the traditional home of the Arapaho and the Cheyenne peoples. Historically, white communities have often been centered in environmental education and the contributions of Black, Indigenous, and people of color have been excluded from our narratives. Black, Indigenous, and people of color have vibrant, rich histories and cultures that contribute to our field, and we all have a responsibility to continue working to change the systems that continue to allow injustice 
and inequity to exist. And I invite you to share uh, the lands of the peoples who were you're on their traditional homelands in the chat if uh, you would like to. Let's jump into certification. So what is certification? Certification is a little bit different than what we might think of as a certificate. A certificate is generally based on seat time or completing a course. Um, and you complete it and you get the certificate. A certification is generally based on demonstrating mastery. So you have to provide evidence that you have mastered a set of competencies. And we ask that folks demonstrate this work through a portfolio. And that portfolio can be a body of your work over time representing those, those competencies. And the competencies that we use that we base certification on are based on the North American Association for Environmental Education Guidelines for Excellence. And they were uh, put together by thousands of environmental educators across the country, commented and reviewed and revised to really think about what is it that an environmental educator should know and be able to do to know that we're meeting a really high uh, standard of quality. We also took those competencies that were developed at the national level and took them and refined them for Colorado. And those became the Colorado Guidelines for Environmental Educators. And so that's what this certification is based on and what you will be demonstrating throughout your portfolio. There are two different levels of certification, the certified level and the master certified level. Uh, master certified is beefier. It's got a little more information than the certified level. Uh, the two biggest differences, and there are a lot of smaller ones throughout, but the, the biggest difference is at the certified level, we're really looking that you show mastery of each theme that we'll talk about. And at the master certified level, we're really looking, we want to see details on each competency within that theme. At the certified level, you can submit uh, lessons and reflect on lessons that you have taught, but you didn't necessarily need to have write, written that program or lesson. Whereas at the master certified level, we do ask that you submit something that you have created. And then the other big difference is in the assessment and evaluation piece. Um, at the certified level, we want you to understand assessment and evaluation and why it's important. At the master certified level, we want to see that you're able to design and implement a full program evaluation. And we'll get into a little more detail on that. Just a little bit of background on how this program developed. Really started in 2005 with the first publication of the NAAAE guidelines for excellence. Um, in what an environmental educator should know and be able to do, and the development then of modifying those specifically for Colorado. We spent the next three years working on the program design for certification with a committee that came together to, to think about and, and do that work and launched the very first pilot program in 2008. Since 2008, we now have 166 certified environmental educators that have gone through the program and demonstrated the highest levels of, of quality. We're not the only state that has a certified environmental educator program. Uh, you can see there are 14 states across the country that also offer a program and, and the programs look a little bit different depending on where you are. Uh, Kentucky, for example, theirs is a course-based program where you attend four weekend long courses to compile your work, whereas ours can be totally self-paced. Um, several of the programs, including Colorado's program, is accredited by the North American Association for Environmental Education, which means it meets all of their standards uh, for the highest quality in program. And what that means is when you are, when you receive a certification certification, a master certification from Colorado, that's transferable to other states because we've met those national credentials. So why participate in certification? Uh, first, it's an opportunity for professional development. It helps build and demonstrate strong foundations in environmental literacy. 
Second, it's a way to position yourself for success within the environmental education field. I have anecdotally have heard folks say it's the first thing folks ask about on their resume uh, when that's listed. And it's another way to demonstrate that you have skills and knowledge in the field. As a certified environmental educator, you are helping to build a network of highly qualified environmental educators in Colorado. And we, we know we have incredible educators here in the state, but this helps us demonstrate it. And fourth, and I think most importantly, certification is a way to personalize and tailor your own professional development. Because you're demonstrating your skill, what this process asks you to do is really go back and reflect on why do I do the things that I do and why is this good practice? And I know personally for me going through the program, it was a really good way for me to reflect on my own practice and say, you know what, I could be doing more of this or yeah, that's why I do that. That's a good practice. Uh, and it was really helpful as a professional development experience for me. So what knowledge and skills do you need to demonstrate to show that you are qualified to be certified? There are five of them, five themes that fall that we ask you to demonstrate within a portfolio. Uh, the first is environmental literacy. And we're really thinking about your personal environmental literacy. What knowledge and skills do you have that make you a good educator? The second big bucket theme in the process is foundations of environmental education. Do you know some of the foundations of the field, where it came from, what the goals are? Environmental education is one of those words that sounds super intuitive. And you're like, well, of course, it's education about the environment. Uh, but there's a lot to it. And there's a lot of things that are really important within the field that this theme allows us to break down and and take a look at. The third is professional responsibilities of environmental education. And, and we want our certified environmental educators to demonstrate professionalism and best practices. And so uh, doing that and demonstrating that. The fourth one I would say by far is the meatiest process that you, part of the portfolio that you're looking at. There's a lot packed in here. And that's planning and implementing environmental education. How do you actually put all this stuff together um, and create great teaching and learning? And then finally, and this piece is what I would say is the hardest. It's the hardest for our field as a whole, but really demonstrating your knowledge of assessment and evaluation and, and understanding the differences between those two things. So what I'd like us to do is to play with this a little bit. And so I am going to stop sharing my screen here for just a second. And I'm gonna stick a link in the chat that if you can, I'd love for you to pop over to. And under each one of those themes that I shared, there are a number of competencies that fall underneath them. So on this link, you can just take a few minutes and start sorting them out. The colored cards are the themes themselves. So put each one of those in its own box. Uh, and then what goes in that theme? What things might you need to demonstrate to demonstrate your own environmental literacy? What things might you need to demonstrate to demonstrate um, the foundations of EE. And I will say this activity is a, not necessarily a right or wrong answer because some of these could definitely go in more than one bucket, but it'll just help us dig in a little bit and get your hands on the different competencies that you need to be thinking about. So I'm gonna give you uh, three or four minutes to sort those out. Uh, if you finish sorting those, go ahead and type in the chat and I'll start to get a sense of um, when folks are done with that. All right, so I've, I'm pu I've pulled this up on my screen. 
would love to have you unmute um, or type in the chat and Kat, maybe you can help me if things pop up in the chat. Uh, what did you put in theme one? I put knowledge of environmental systems. Yeah. environment yeah that first one absolutely definitely anything else that folks put in theme one alex mentioned the evolution of environmental education that's a gr great one to think about um that one in the competencies and like i said several of these can go in several different boxes so there aren't necessarily wrong answers here but um that one we categorize in the foundation so knowing a little bit about the history of the field um we plug into the foundations of environmental education for the first one, I put personal and civic responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yep, that one definitely goes there. I have to find them quickly here. Make sure that. How about the processes of addressing environmental issues? Yes, that one goes in there as well. There's one more. I put questioning analysis and interpretation skills. Yes. So th that makes up the, the bulk of theme one. And again, we're looking for your knowledge of environmental literacy. So do you have the background and the skills to be able to teach it? And so when you think about these things, we want to know, are you able to break down and address an environmental issue? Uh, do you have knowledge in environmental processes and systems? Um, what personal and civic responsibility do you take part in? And how do you use questioning analysis and interpretation skills? So this theme is, is pretty personal. And I will say, just to point out a couple um, places where they, there tends to be stumbling blocks, um, especially when thinking about processes of addressing environmental issues, we get a lot of really great submissions that show what an environmental issue looks like from the natural side. So they talk about the impacts to the environment and talk about uh, the pros and cons of different solutions environmentally, but we also wanna know the social side. So make sure when you're doing your environmental when you're demonstrating these skills, that you're talking about the different stakeholders, what their values are, and why they think we should take different courses of actions, um, and make sure that both of those elements are included in there um, is a really good, good piece to think about. Any ideas on things that you might include in a portfolio that would demonstrate any of these things? I'll give you a few examples. Knowledge of environmental processes and systems. Um, a, a lot of times we will get transcripts. Um, folks will show that they've had some workshops or professional development demonstrating that they have learned different aspects of environmental processes and systems. A beefed up resume can be really great that shows some of the, the coursework that you've done or PDs that you've participated in. Uh, can be really great to show that. One thing I will say about the knowledge and of environmental processes and systems, um, when reviewers look at that, they do look at it subjectively. And the knowledge of environmental processes of, and systems that a preschool environmental educator might need might be very different than what a college professor needs. 
And so we expect that evidence to reflect your body of work. And we wouldn't expect everyone to turn in or have similar ev evidence to what a college professor might um, present. So know that we're looking at it as a whole as the reviewers and um, looking at kind of your goals and you as an educator and what you might need there. Um, so there is some flexibility there. We definitely get in this theme a lot of essays. People will submit papers they've done for courses to demonstrate the process of addressing environmental issues. Uh, we've had folks submit newsletter articles that they've written that demonstrate that they're explaining something. Um, we've gotten some just personal essays that reflect on their own experience different types of things like that. So there's lots of types of evidence that you could include for this theme. So we already have one in theme two, two the foundations of environmental education. Did, what else did you put in this category? Uh, the fundamental characteristics and goals. Yes. That absolutely goes there. And for this, a lot, a lot of the evidence we get is, is essays or kind of more like a report. Um, I think we will get some folks that submit things like a lesson plan, and then they tie that lesson back to each of the goals and show demonstrate how it's meeting each of the goals is a great way we've seen folks do that and demonstrate those. Um, those goals. Anything else that lives in theme two? A climate for learning about and exploring the environment. Great thought. We actually categorize that in um, planning and implementing environmental education. And again, these can go in multiple categories. Um, and the way we're thinking about that one is how do you, as you're teaching, think about the social, emotional, and physical safety of your learners. How do you make sure you're avoiding risk? Uh, how to make sure you're adapting when the weather turns totally uh, not what you expected? Um, how do you allow for intellectual safety and questioning and all of those things? So. Uh, particularly with that one, we, we're looking for how does this apply when you're teaching and love reflections that come back uh, showing this didn't go how I thought it was going to go. And here's how I adapted to make sure that we were able to create that climate for learning about and exploring the environment. Anything else that might go in theme two? Two other things that are a little, um, I would say, could go in multiple categories. We put how environmental education is implemented in this category. And what we're looking for is your knowledge of partners, resources you can tap into, um, all the different ways that you might engage in environmental education. And um, a lot of folks will write about partnerships that they engage in um, and how they tap into kind of the bigger community. The other one that lives in here it is knowledge of environmental education materials and resources. And there are a lot of materials and resources that are out there, a lot of great ones, but there's also some that are not so great. And so, uh, we want to know how you're looking at those materials and how you're evaluating them and selecting what you use um, in your materials. And there actually is a set of national guidelines for materials. So what a lot of folks will do is submit uh, a description of a lesson um, or a material that you use and evaluate it against those criteria to, to see what that looks like. Uh, is a great thing that we see submitted for evidence. How about theme three? Anything that um, you put in the bucket for theme three? 
This is professional responsibilities of the environmental educator. Emphasis. On, oh, I was going to say emphasis on education, not advocacy. This one is a weird one because I actually think it probably fits really well in this category, but we, for some reason, we put it in theme four. <laughs> um, and this is a, I think, important one in our field, uh, but it's also one that I think is changing. Um, so it's an interesting one, but what we're looking for here in this competency is for you to, to demonstrate when you might wear different hats. And advocacy is great and it is an important tool and we should be using it. Education is an important tool and we should be using it. So the, the, what we're looking for is for folks to describe a little bit about when you wear each of those hats and how you select the tools that you use. Um, and, and when do you emphasize education versus advocacy rather than choosing one because I think they are both incredibly important. Absolutely. Anything else that might live in theme three? Ongoing learning and professional development. Yes, absolutely. It's, um, we love to see what you've done in the past in terms of professional development. Some folks submit an essay and talk about things that they've done and how it's benefited them. We've had folks submit certificates from different things that they've participated in. Um, if you present professional development, you can definitely talk about that and what you've learned from it. Um, this is another piece where a really detailed resume can be a helpful piece of evidence that you can use to demonstrate that theme. Uh, there's one more that goes in this category. Any ideas what that might be? Improving instruction. That's a, a great thought and is definitely a responsibility of the environmental educator. We, when we're talking about improving instruction in this particular case, we're thinking about how do you use assessment and evaluation to improve instruction? That one's a little hard to suss out without, uh, with just those two words. The other one that we love to see is exemplary environmental education practice. And so what we're looking for there is evidence that shows that you're using responsible practice. So a lot of folks will submit things like a letter of recommendation from a supervisor or a colleague that says, this is what I see uh, from this educator. We also ask, and this is the only piece of evidence that is specifically required in the portfolio, uh, the rest you, you really have an opportunity, as long as you demonstrate the competency, it doesn't matter what you submit. Um, but in theme three, we have a code of ethics that we ask everyone to sign and include that says, yep, I agree to really commit myself to these environmental education practices. Awesome. Jumping over to theme four, we've already got a climate for learning about and exploring the environment and emphasis on education, not advocacy. Anything else that might live in theme four? Knowledge of various teaching methods. Yes, absolutely. We do ask you to submit, um, and it's a little bit different for each certification level, um, but we do ask you to submit a couple different lesson plans and talk about what teaching methods are included in those lesson plans and think about how those play out and why you would use each of those teaching methods in that aspect. So we definitely like to see a couple of different kinds of methods being implemented for sure. So definitely with that one, um, a lot of folks submit things like a reflection on a lesson plan. What else?
planning for any stretches? Yep, absolutely. And one of the things we're looking for there is both kind of a knowledge of, of what are some of the bigger goals that we're connecting back to, whether that's state academic standards, whether that's um, national standards for environmental education, but how are you using those in your practice? Um, and we're also looking for, do you have goals and objectives and do your, the activities in your lesson match those goals and objectives? And how are you, you planning? So um, that is often part of either a reflection um, on a lesson plan that's submitted or kind of looking at the lesson plan to look at those goals. And then one more lives over here and that is knowledge about learners and learning. So we're looking for there, like, are you using age appropriate teaching practices? Um, how are you assessing what learners already know when they come to you and using that? How are you using learner interest to guide your instruction? Um, and we get reflections. Um, this, this theme is pretty reflection heavy. And we'll also get papers that folks have written maybe on um, Bloom's taxonomy or on um, different developmentally appropriate practices and those types of things. So we'll see, see a lot of that as well. I have a question. Yeah. When you say reflections, what, um, how long are these usually? We actually don't put any um, I guess parameters around that. It's as long as it takes for you to describe and and adequately showcase that competency. And some people are able to do that in a really short amount. And some people, um, depending on their evidence, takes a lot longer. And I will say, you know, thinking about master level portfolios, and these are digging into a lot of information. I have gotten a master level portfolio that is 30 pages long, and I have gotten one that was a foot and a half tall. And, you know, depending on the evidence you submit, like say, like we've had folks apply that have done dissertations as part of their educational background. And so they might include a dissertation in their portfolio, but they might flag something in there. So we're only reading here's the relevant part of the dissertation for this. Um, so in terms of that makes length a little hard to define because it totally depends on the type of evidence that you're submitting, um, what that might look like. But great question. And I will say it's one of the, the best things and the most frustrating things about the certification process is that there is so much wiggle room. So on one hand, you might be like, just tell me what to do. And on the other hand, it might open up lots of doors about the types of evidence you can include because you're able to plug in lots of different types of evidence that explore and demonstrate that competency. As I mentioned earlier, this fifth theme is, is one of the hardest in the portfolio, um, particularly at the master level. We don't require nearly as much in this theme at the certified level. Um, but assessment and evaluation is hard and the environmental education field as a whole is still figuring it out and really working to figure out how do we best capture our impact. And so one of the things we're looking for is do you understand the difference between assessment and evaluation? And those those words are used interchangeably a lot. Um, how we're using them, learn, assessment is based on the learner. So uh, an assessment would tell you that today Kat learned X, Y, and Z. And I can say, okay, Kat learned this. I know where she's at, um, but it's very learner focused. Evaluation, we're thinking about program evaluation. So did the program work to do what we wanted it to do? And a lot of times you will use assessments 
as a tool in your program evaluation when you start to look at the compilation of all of those assessments. That's a useful evaluation tool to tell you um, if you're getting where you want to go. So we're looking at both in this theme. The first competency is really around learner outcomes and what we're looking there for there. So we already talked about planning for instruction a little bit. Did you set goals and objectives? And this one is kind of an outgrowth of that and really captures, do your outcomes match how you're assessing and evaluating the program? So if, if your assessment that you're giving learners is, what tree is this? but your outcome was, I want students to feel more connected to nature, then those don't necessarily match up. So we're looking to see, are you measuring what you set out to do with this one? And then assessment that is part of instruction, that could be demonstrating all kinds of techniques. Like how is this embedded in your lesson? How is your program? Um, or however you capture your instruction. Do you use questioning strategies? Do you use games to check understanding? Um, but how are you checking understanding along the way as part of what you do in your instruction? And then improving instruction, you can either be talking about assessment or evaluation, but we wanna know what do you do with that data that you're collecting either informally or formally, but how do you use that data to actually make changes in your program or your instruction? And, and that could be like describing a time where you asked a series of questions and realized, gosh, they still weren't getting it. And so I revamped and went back and, and did this to make sure that they were connecting with the material. Or it could be we did all these surveys, we collected the data very formally, and this is what we learned and this is how we changed the program as a result. But we wanna see what, what you're changing. I will say in theme five, it is very tempting for folks to submit examples of evaluations that are all rated phenomenally, like all the fives are circled, but you did great. But that makes it very hard to see how you improve instruction based on those. So be thinking about in this theme, it's actually okay to show and we want to see where something wasn't going exactly how you wanted it to go and how you changed it as a result. Evaluating programming, that's probably the hardest piece of this. And um, at the certified level, we really want you to demonstrate that you understand why that's important. Whereas at the master level, we want you to demonstrate that you are able to conduct an evaluation from start to finish. And that's everything from designing your evaluation questions, selecting the tools, because uh, we do want to see when you're evaluating, a lot of folks will just submit a tool and it's a great tool but we don't actually know if it answers your evaluation questions or not, unless we can see what those questions are. Then we wanna know how you analyze the data and what changes you make as a result of the evaluation. And uh, folks have submitted a variety of, of different things for this. It could be an evaluation report. It could be an evaluation plan. Um, and some of it could be hypothetical. Like you could talk about, gosh, I haven't actually implemented this evaluation plan. Uh, so I don't have the decisions we're going to make yet, but if we see these results, I anticipate we would do this. Or if I saw this, I anticipate we would do this. Um, so you can do a, a little bit of that in this theme. Um, but we want to make sure that wherever you go as an environmental educator at the master level that you're able to design and implement an evaluation. That's a lot of information. Any questions that are coming up about the different themes that you would be showcasing in a portfolio? I guess. 
um, would it be like, as you submit a portfolio, would you submit things under the certain themes or would you just have one big, be like, this could be interpreted for multiple things, like sort of the different boxes that may have been different places? Great question. The more you can organize your portfolio, the easier it makes it for a reviewer. So they're human and they definitely miss things sometimes. So um, having something labeled as like, this is the evidence I'm submitting for theme one is a great idea. But at the same time, you might submit something that you're like, this demonstrates theme one, but it also demonstrates theme four. And all you have to do is note that somewhere and make sure it's clear that you're using it for both. Um, so, so that you're telling us where to look for those things. Um, so you can definitely use pieces of evidence more than once. And I will say theme four and five in particular tend to flow into each other. So you might be submitting a lesson plan in theme four and talking about some of those things, some of the theme four competencies. And then in theme five, you might be referring back to that same lesson and describing how you use the assessment there. So, um, so the organization of the portfolio is very different depending on whatever your evidence looks like, but the better you can label it, the more likely it is that, that reviewers will find what you're showcasing. Great question. I have one more. Um, yeah. Uh, because you were saying that you have like a stack foot of paper. Do they all have to be submitted hard copy or is it something that can be done virtually? It can definitely be submitted in a, a number of ways. We get a variety. I would say most of them now are, are virtual, although the ones we got early on, we got a lot of hard copies, but we'll still accept hard copies. Um, so we will, we've gotten things that are, um, more like a binder or we got one several years ago that was almost like a scrapbook like they took a, a it was beautiful um took a lot of time to just make it really pretty so we definitely accept hard copies um we are seeing now folks are even submitting like websites to collect things um and they're submitting like a Google Doc that then links to other Google Docs. And then some folks will just submit a PDF that has everything in it. Um, so we get a variety of different types of, of portfolios. Great question. I'm gonna pull back up our slideshow here. And we've talked about this quite a bit, but just to reiterate, there are lots of different types of evidence that you can submit and use. Um, and here are some examples and I'll make sure to send out a copy of this slideshow as well. So you have this, but um, we've gotten pieces of artwork. We've gotten um, articles, brochures, essays, reflections, transcripts, uh, lesson plans, all kinds of different things that help demonstrate the competencies. I will also say that this portfolio is yours. So um, if there's a way to make it in a way that can be useful to you again, like if you wanted to use this to present as your professional portfolio, you can do that as well. Uh, I always use the example of, of one year we got a portfolio that had a, a Boston a marathon race card time in it. And while that didn't demonstrate any of the specific EE competencies, I can definitely see where in a professional portfolio, that would be a great thing to show because it showcases determination and drive and ability to carry out goals. So feel free to make this uh, what you would like it to be and include extra things if you would like. 
I want to spend a few minutes talking about the process for getting certified. Um, one of the first steps is just to submit an interest form and that just let us lets us know that you're thinking about it um, or working on it and that way we can send you reminders about deadlines and and things like that um, and you can find that interest form on our website and just to um, fill that out and kind of get on the list and then portfolio development is really at your own pace. You can work on that um, and put that together however you would like. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention about the evidence that you use is there's no time frame on it. So you can use something that you created just for the portfolio, or you can use something that you created 30 years ago in another state um, that demonstrates the competency. So definitely there's no there's no time frame on how you you pulse pieces together so for some folks um who have saved all the body of evidence the process is a little bit easier rather than if you're kind of starting from scratch so that really varies in terms of of how long it takes folks to to put that together then yeah the next step after you've completed your portfolio is to submit that to CAE. We have two times a year that we accept portfolios. And I th believe the date this year is April 23rd and uh, August 31st. Or the we have a spring and a fall submission deadline. And each portfolio is reviewed by at least three reviewers. And we do that because reviewers are human and they miss things. And so after each reviewer has reviewed your portfolio individually, they will get together and discuss and talk about um, and come to consensus on where they, how they thought, thought the portfolio uh, came together. For certification, there is there is never a time where we say, no, you're not certified. You will either get a notification that, yes, you were certified, or you will get a notification of, hey, can we have a little bit more evidence on X? Um, and, we'll, and you don't need to resubmit the whole portfolio. There's no fee to resubmit that evidence. Um, we want you to be certified, and so, um, that can happen as long or as many times as it needs to uh, to get the information that that reviewers need to see. And I will say most of the time reviewers are like, I really think it's there, but I just can't explicitly see it. And so they'll ask for a little bit more information. Um, so we just chatted through all of that. Uh, costs for certification, if your organization is a member of CAE, an organizational member, uh, each organization is entitled to one free certification every year. So you can definitely uh, tap into that benefit if your organization is a member. Otherwise, costs for the certified level are $60 for members, uh, $100 for non-members, and for master, it's um, $200 for a member and $240 for a non-member. We do ask that everyone recertify every seven years and that fee is um, a $30, $35 fee every seven years. We do offer an online course that is aligned with certification. So that online course uh, is called Principles and Foundations of EE and all the assignments for the course are also things that you could use for evidence in the portfolio. And so if you take the course, um, there's a discounted fee for submitting your portfolio. I have a question about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I took the course last summer, but I wasn't ready to do the, the certification. Does the course still count? Yes, absolutely. Oh, awesome. Great. So if you're looking for where to find things on the website, um, if you go to our, our certification page and click on the how to be certified page, and I know this is microscopic, um, you'll see a green button for the interest form. That's that top arrow. 
and you'll see those arrows in the middle of the page are where you download the rubrics that describe in detail everything that you need to include in your portfolio. And then uh, the button at the bottom to submit that your portfolio. The rubrics are probably the most important tool that you have to putting together your portfolio. So the um, when you're looking at the master rubric, you will see at the top, you'll see the theme that we talked about. And then you'll see that second highlighted piece where it says 1.1 questioning analysis and interpretation skills. That's the competency. Underneath novice developing and master, those are that's how reviewers are rating your portfolio. Um, to get master level certification, you need to be mostly in the master category for all of the themes. Um, and that describes exactly what you need to show. The suggested response on the right side there, those are suggestions. If you're like, gosh, what does this look like? That will give you an idea, but in no way, shape or form is that what you have to submit. It's just to provide some extra examples. For the certified level rubric, um, it reads a little bit differently. Same thing, you have the, the theme and the competencies listed. For the certified level rubric, you don't have to show evidence of every single competency, but we keep them in there because sometimes you have the opportunity to kind of pick and choose which ones you want to show um, competencies for. So you do have to show evidence for everything that is in the, at least the adequate level of the rubric. So if you're adequate or target, you will be eligible for certification. And again, same thing with the suggested response there on the right. Those are purely suggestions, but not required. Just an example of what that might look like. Um, definitely reach out to us with any questions you have. I'm always happy to, to answer questions. We definitely want you to use things you already have uh, in your body of work, in your portfolio. Um, and again, this is yours. So we hope you take it and make it what you will. And then here are just a couple of resources you can tap into. Uh, if you're looking for background on the foundations of EE, uh, NAAAE has published a free ebook called Across the Spectrum that is great on some of the background knowledge. We mentioned the online course that we run. Um, there's one going on as we speak right now, and that is all aligned to the certification process. Uh, the guidelines for excellence in environmental education are all very embedded into uh, what's required for certification. So I always recommend that you tap into those and, and look at those resources. And then the North American Association for Environmental Education has several courses that are totally self-paced, totally free, uh, that you can go through online on what is EE, the history of EE, on research and evaluation and on equity and inclusion that are really great resources if you're looking for additional things to tap into. Um, I would also recommend, just in our last minute here, if you haven't already, create a free account on NAAAE's website uh, on EE Pro. You can tap into tons of great learning opportunities, um, tons of groups that are having discussions, and this is all free. And then that blue arrow there in the middle of the screen where it says self-assessment, that is a self-assessment on the guidelines that are part of certification. And so uh, if you take that self-assessment and let's say you rank yourself lower on a couple of areas, EE Pro will automatically develop a list of of all the learning opportunities that they know about that are in those categories. So it's a really cool resource. Uh, and I think we are right about at time, but I am more than happy to hang on and answer any questions that you have. Um, always feel free to email me or give me a ring. And uh, there's more information on the website uh, if you need to tap into that. Thank you so much for joining us today. and. I hope you are able to participate in the program. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks a bunch for all the info.
Thank you.